Good evening, good afternoon, everyone gathered for the 25th consecutive monthly picket action to for US Canada hands off Venezuela and free Alex Saab and also the free Alex Saab postcard campaign launch. You are in the right place. We're going to give people to uh, about two minutes to join. So uh, grab a glass of water, some coffee, and get ready for um, some important updates on the case of Alex Saab and our continued struggle in solidarity with the people of Venezuela. Thank you. Good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 25th consecutive monthly picket action for US Canada hands off Venezuela and launch of the free Alex Saab postcard campaign. We are here uh, at an event organized by the Venezuela Peace Committee in Winnipeg, the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice Venezuela Solidarity Campaign and Just Peace Advocates, along with the support of Venezuela solidarity organizations and individuals across Canada. For more than two years, we have united our voices for an end to these unjust, criminal, uh, unilateral coercive measures, also known as sanctions and blockade against the people of Venezuela and demanding freedom for jailed Venezuelan diplomat held in the United States, Alex Saab. This online picket tonight has simultaneous interpretation in English and Spanish because some of our presenters are speaking in English and others in Spanish. So if you'd like, I encourage you to uh, go to the bottom of your screen where you'll find an icon in the shape of a globe. You might have to press the more button or the three dots and then choose to listen to the program either in English or Spanish. Um, and thank you to Anna and Julieta for your help with interpretation today. Today's event is broadcast from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada the traditional unceded and stolen territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, and Squamish Coast Salish nations. We recognize that in all of our work for self-determination for oppressed nations from Venezuela all the way to Indigenous nations here in Canada. My name is Alison Bodine. 
I am the coordinator of the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, and also author of the book, Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Venezuela from Battle of Ideas Press. We'll put a note in the, in the chat. If you haven't gotten a copy, I'll be glad to put one in the mail for you. I am um, really looking forward to tonight's picket coming at a very urgent time for Venezuelan diplomat Alex Saab. On March 16th, just under two weeks ago, the Alex Saab movement in Venezuela and Camilla Saab, Alex Saab's wife, issued an urgent call denouncing the treatment of Alex Saab in US prison. There are signs that his health is deteriorating and he is being denied access to medical treatment in the US prison system, including treatment for a possible recurrence of stomach cancer, which he has had in the past. This is a continuation of the torture and medical neglect that Alex Saab has faced starting when he was first held and arrested in Cape Verde before he was kidnapped to the United States. It has now been over 1,000 days that Alex Saab has been denied adequate medical treatment, visits from his family. Alex, since coming to the United States, has never been denied, has never been allowed his right to have a visit from um, a representative of the diplomatic mission from the government of Venezuela in the United States and is constantly being denied his right to freedom, which he should have uh, as a diplomat. So uh, his case is taking on a new and urgent level. And that's why we wanted to make today's picket not only um, you know, an action to, to mark uh, and to unite our voices for his freedom, but also an urgent call um, for folks to join in and support the free Alex Saab uh, postcard campaign. So I'm just trying to figure out how to make this work with the camera. Postcard campaign, um, which has been launched by the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, and offers a really excellent way for people to uh, sign a postcard and put it in the mail uh, addressed to US President Biden, demanding freedom for Alex Saab. Uh, so we'll talk about this more later and how to get a copy of your postcards. Um, but that is what we are here today uh, in order to accomplish together. We have a really excellent program, um, which I am looking forward to getting into, featuring speakers from Venezuela, Canada, and the United States. Roy Gar Lopez, David Paul, and Bhagwan Sandhu, it is a pleasure to have you on the panel today and also to be joined once again by Professor Luis Acuna, who's the charge de affairs of the Venezuelan Embassy in Canada and is joining us from Venezuela. As we start today, I um, wanted to play just two short videos to give some context to our picket action. Um, one you will see is a, a bit of an update. It is in Spanish, but will be translated uh, about the current status of Alex Saab's health. And the second is a video of support and solidarity from musician, world-renowned musician and activist for social justice, Roger Waters. Um, so we're gonna play those videos as a few more folks joined this evening and we'll get started with our panel. Thank you. Estados Unidos tiene detenido a un diplomático venezolano desde hace más de dos años. Su nombre es Alex Saab. Su delito, haber llevado alimentos, medicinas y gasolina a Venezuela en los peores años del bloqueo estadounidense. Su vida corre peligro. Lleva varias semanas vomitando sangre con fuertes dolores estomacales. 
long weeks and has had very strong familia tiene una recurrencia del cáncer de estómago que ya sufrió denuncia que Estados Unidos no le brinda atención médica adecuada y le suministran ansiolíticos en contra de su voluntad desde que está detenido en Estados Unidos no le ha permitido la visita de su médico, de familiares ni de un representante consular su esposa pide al Comité Internacional de la Cruz Roja verificar su estado de salud. Solicita al Alto Comisionado de Derechos Humanos de la ONU y al Secretario General del Organismo tomar cartas en el asunto. Su detención arbitraria en orden de la Interpol es un caso único en el mundo que viola la Convención de Viena. Alex arriesgó su familia, su vida y su libertad por ayudar a Venezuela. Activistas, gobiernos y defensores de derechos humanos exigen liberación. Salvemos a Alex. I'm in uh, Lisbon, first gig today. Check it out. Sort of beautiful. Anyway, that's not why I'm making this video. Of It says to POTUS. For those of you who don't know, POTUS is the President of the United States of America. Um, I tell you why uh, um, I'm making this little video is because I saw I read an article this morning about Alex Saab, the Venezuelan diplomat, and uh, I've just who's in prison, obvi obviously on trumped-up charges in Florida, and um, I've just read that he's very sick, and they won't let him see a doctor. They won't even let him see his own doctor. They won't let his wife and his kids visit him. They won't anything, 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 because. They're murdering him for no reason at all. He's a diplomat from Venezuela, for those of you who don't know. Read about it. Read about it. Read about it. Okay. Dear POTUS, not all that dear to me, Joe, but anyway, the whole world knows you are murdering Alex Saab, the Venezuelan diplomat. He is gravely ill needs medical care that's first thing so stop it please free Alex Saab now yeah that, that's what I wrote down on my laptop while you're about it it's about time you freed Julian Assange as well and while we're on the subject of freeing people what about Leonard Peltier who's been locked up for over 40 years on trumped up charges That's all I have to say, and I don't mean to grin because none of this is funny. And but I am happy because I'm doing the first gig of my European tour today. All right, so so it's whatever. But that's not important. What is important? Alex Saab, free him, send him home to Venezuela to his wife and children who need him. What is wrong with you? So that was a, a short update on the case of Alex Saab and a video from Roger Waters. Um, as a, a from fire this time, who's helping with the tech here is going to post in the chat the links to the videos so you can watch them again. I know the translation might have been a bit difficult to hear. Uh, so, uh, I mean, as a summary, we'll hear from Roygar more about Alex Saab's situation right now. And you could see in the photos, for example, support for Alex Saab from uh, Elida Guevara, the daughter of Che Guevara, a Cuban doctor, physician, and activist. Uh, support from Oscar Lopez Rivera, a former Puerto Rican political prisoner. Uh, so our voices are added internationally with others fighting for freedom for Alex Saab who is in jail for his work to try and alleviate just a small amount of the pain and suffering caused on the people of Venezuela by the criminal US sanctions and blockade. So um, without further ado, uh, it's really a pleasure uh, for me to introduce Roigar Lopez, who is a tireless and constant fighter for freedom for Alex Saab. 
He's here representing the Free Alex Saab movement in Venezuela. His focus has been on digital communications in the campaign for Alex Saab's freedom. And you can often find him, uh, you know, talking to the media, giving interviews and, and updating uh, both people in Venezuela and around the world about this urgent case uh, and demanding justice for Alex Saab. So, um, Roigar Lopez, please, the floor is yours. Uh, welcome to tonight's virtual picket. Muchas gracias. Thank Buenas you noches. very much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Alison, for organizing this picket action all month, every month, an international event to um, in solidarity with Alex Ab. So a big hug to you from Venezuela. Thank you for the space you provide each month to us. And here we can provide some updates on this case and, and to disseminate this re, this den, denouncement. Also, I wanted to greet David Paul. We were here together a couple of days ago, and I wanted to greet Bhagwan Sandhu and Professor Luisa Cunha as well. Thank you, Alex. Today, uh, March the 28th, this marks 1,019 days kidnapped 528 days in the federal prison of Miami. He has been in the United States for more years than the 421 days he was uh, torturing Cape Verde. And he's still suffering, even though he's in a different sort of prison. So I wanted to provide some updates and also repeat some of the things you said at, at the beginning, but it's never, um, it, it's always necessary to say this. I want to read a small part of the release, the press release that was issued on March the 16th, which was where Camila Fabri, the wife of Alex Ab, uh, presented um, the case at the international press release because she wanted to denounce an emergency. It reads, Alex Ab is at the federal center of Miami and his prison situation is even worse than in Cabo Verde. He has, now, he has not been allowed uh, visits and he has not seen his wife nor his children for two years and eight months who have also been uh, victims of persecution on the part of the United States and allied countries, Europe. He has not been allowed consular representative uh, visits, which is a right to all prisoners. The State Department of the United States has not responded to the request of the government of Venezuela to uh, be granted this visit as established by the Vienna Convention. In the medical reports, the doctor had already informed that they had an identified bleeding in the digestive tract, which could mean a recurrence of the cancer. It's very alarming to know that Alex has been vomiting blood for weeks, and despite having reported this to the American authorities, there's still a lack of medical attention at the prison. So why? Hasn't the United States uh, treated him? This is the the denouncement that we, the claim that we are making from the Free Alex Ab movement. He has not received after after um, issuing this at the press release. He has not received medical care. So this is very dangerous. We believe that he is at a risk, a danger, and we are urgently demanding humanitarian action. And of course, what we have been demanding ever since day one, his freedom due to his diplomatic status, his health status, and because he has been uh, detained without a single proof, a single evidence. Five, five days after the press release, the defense lawyers, alongside with other lawyers who work at the, in the United States, submitted documents called amicus curiae. These type of documents, I, I'm, I'm going to read a, a snippet of a 
Twitter thread by one of the lawyers explaining these amicus curiae documents and who are the people submitting these before the 11th circuit where we are uh, making an appeal challenging the unjust decision taken uh, last year this amicus curiae was presented as support for the defense of Alex Saab and its arguments. This uh, entails a third party offering spontaneously uh, an expert opinion with the aim to help the court in the uh, resolution. So Sir Ivor Roberts, Timothy Roberts, Eileen Densa and Giuseppe Puma have been included here. The Sir Ivor is a renowned diplomat, expert in international law. He offers his knowledge and his experience of over 38 years on the role of the special envoy. The diplomat, the diplomat's aim is to have international law respected and the diplomat's role respected. Tim Morris was a British diplomat serving in Japan, Spain, and Portugal before becoming the ambassador in Morocco and Mauritania between 2008 and 2012. He was a special envoy to peace conversation in South Sudan in 2014. This is to determine if the Florida uh, judge made a mistake, as we are asserting, uh, by interpreting this law and denying diplomat immunity to Alex Saab. Alex Saab is a special envoy on by Venezuela because this was a temporary mission. Second, he was coming, traveling from one state to another, and third, he has he had been accepted by the receiving country, the Republic of Iran. So they had received and accepted this mission. In its arguments, they point out that special missions have a long history, being the first diplomat uh, classifications in history. And there have been this sort of missions from early on in human history. So this is in the hands of the 11th Circuit, which in the next few weeks will be calling both parties so that they can present all the arguments in this challenge, this appeal, and so that we can finally um, win this case there in Florida courts. Finally, I wanted to make a comment on the latest statements by John Kirby in the United States celebrating the fight uh, of corruption in Venezuela. I wanted to remind you that in Venezuela there has been a person uh, detained uh, called Fart Leonard uh, for corruption. He is accused of um, blackmailing and acting in corruption actions, the, the largest corruption actions in the army of the United States. He was trying to get to Russia and the Supreme Court of Venezuela sent a communicate to the State Department to inform them of the detention of Leonard and to tell them that they, they had 60 days to, to extradit him. So, so far we have not uh, known whether the State Department has uh, requested this extradition. So from our point of view as the movement, we think that the United States would like to have Leonard and also would like to know that the State Department would like to think the State Department would like to free an innocent person as Alex said. Finally, I wanted to thank all of you for this invitation to this monthly picket action and to encourage you to write letters to Alexab as you are doing uh, 
Alison, with this beautiful um, campaign of sending postal uh, postcards to Joe Biden. We thank you so much here in Venezuela for that campaign. And also we want to invite you to send letters to Alexa. Here at the Free Alexa Movement, we have an email account, which is cartas at freealexab.org. So if you send a mail to this address, we can uh, forward them, forward the letters to Alexab. He will be very pleased to read them and he will be uh, replying to you. So thank you very much. Let, let's join in this request for Alexa's health so that he can receive uh, medical attention and so that he can be released. Thank you very much. Free Alexa. Thank you very much, Roigar, um, for th that update and appeal uh, to folks. Um, we will put the email in the chat. Brandy, you're asking, I see, we'll, we'll, I believe you are correct. We'll double check that and then put it in the chat. And that's a great way that people can uh, ensure their letters make it to Alex Saab in prison and to help lift his spirits and also let the prison know uh, that the world is watching and, and to um, really help put pressure, hopefully, on the prison uh, to give Alex Saab the medical care that he needs in an urgent and immediate way. Um, so definitely uh, want to encourage people to do that. I also noticed that Indriana Parada, the Venezuelan human rights lawyer uh, from the Free Alex Saab movement, is on the call tonight. Thank you, Indriana, for joining us. And we're going to put in the chat a link uh, to the English PDF version of Indriana's book, which we're really excited about. Um, so uh, hopefully next month we can have Indriana join us and, and tell us about her book and help disseminate and share that far and wide. Um, but we'll put the link to the PDF also in the chat right now and um, encourage folks to, to share that around. Um, we also, uh, I wanted uh, to um, thank Roigar for his support for the Alex Saar uh, postcard campaign. And I saw a few others asking in the chat about how to get the postcards. I'll explain about the campaign a, a little longer in the program, but we'll put it in the chat now um, the email address you can send it to, to to get the postcards. Just send me your address. Um, we'll put them in the mail, um, however many you would like to share with others or to, you know, you could put one in the mail every single day, um, take a picture of yourself doing it. And uh, we will go ahead and send them to you or send you the file if you want to print them yourselves. So um, we'll capture that in the chat. Thank you, everybody. And thank you again, uh, Roy Gar Lopez, for all the work that you've been doing to support uh, the family of Alex Saab and also uh, to organize the movement for his freedom from Venezuela. Our support from people in North America, you know, it is our responsibility to fight for freedom for Alex Saab, to demand that the US government and specifically Joe Biden release him immediately and to organize poor working oppressed people, our, our neighbors, our friends, our family in this campaign. But this work wouldn't be possible without the support of your everyday organizing in Venezuela and the time that you give us each month or when we visit. It's it's crucial and important. Thank you so much um, for joining us here tonight. So um, up next, I want to invite up a, a co-fighter, a, a fellow organizer, someone that I've been you know, really happy to have met on this path of, of standing up uh, in uh, support of Venezuela's self-determination and sovereignty. Um, David, Paul, and I, four years ago nearly, were together in Venezuela on a fact-finding mission to highlight the uh, impact of criminal U.S. sanctions on Venezuela. And since then, David has been a stalwart in this movement for Venezuela. Uh, he was with uh, a member of the Venezuelan Embassy Protection Collective who fought to defend the embassy of Venezuela in Washington, D.C. from a right-wing attack and takeover in 2019. Um, of course, this coming at the time of the U.S. imposition of 
the so-called president of Venezuela, Juan Guaido, and really um, then handing millions of dollars over to Venezuela's opposition in order to try and overthrow the democratically elected government of President Maduro. So this was a critical fight in 2019 where um, dozens of people inside the embassy and hundreds of people outside the embassy stood to try and defend it from a right-wing attack and eventually went on hunger strike. Um, so David was one of the members of that struggle. And he's also a member of the Sanctions Kill Coalition, the Task Force on the Americas, and the Democratic Socialists of the America of America. Um, David was also just gotten back from Venezuela. Uh, he was on a delegation with the Alliance for Global Justice, uh, which marked 10 years since the passing of Comandante Hugo Chavez, participating in public meetings and an international conference on that occasion, but also meeting and talking with people in Venezuela. So uh, that's a lot to report on. And, and I'm sure uh, David is still <laughs> recovering from some of that trip, uh, but it's really great that you're able to be with us here tonight. And uh, the floor is yours, David, Paul. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me okay? <clears throat> yeah, sounds great. Okay, okay good, thanks. Yeah, and um, thanks for all that presentation about Alex Saab, because it's very much on all of our minds. Um, I was in a this delegation of the Alliance for Global Justice. It was basically there to celebrate with other many other people from many other countries um, the 10th anniversary of Hugo Chavez's passing. Uh, the title, of, and we had some other visits. We actually had a very good meeting with Camila Saab and, um, and her legal team uh, talking about the case of Alex Saab, uh, trying to share some ideas, how to approach it. And, um, but most of our time in the delegation was at this conference. Uh, the title was World, The World Meeting on the Relevance of Bolivarian Thoughts of Hugo Chavez. And it was very fitting that it's, uh, this is the 200th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, will be in December, um, and it was very fitting that this um, evaluation of uh, the thoughts and uh, efforts of Hugo Chavez um, and people from around the world coming together to express their opinion, their uh, thoughts and their um, support. There were 147 um, uh, international uh, delegates from 55 countries. They included diplomats writers, presidents, ex-presidents, intellectuals. Some of them were like Arnold August from Canada, James Early from the US, people from the People's Forum in New York, João Pedro, uh, the head of the MST in Brazil, Atilio Barón from uh, Argentina, and um, the daughter of Che Guevara, Aleda Guevara was there, and, and many others. And during these three days of conference, uh, with many panels, they basically many different views, uh, conversations about the historic legacy of Chavez, his vision for a new world. And there was this incredible feeling of love for Chavez and a sense of collective responsibility to continue his work toward a socialist Venezuela. Um, one of the first panels was uh, called Imperialist Persecution of Alex Saab, where Camila Saab herself was there giving details of the, basically the international crime of his kidnapping, torture and uh, false imprisonment. Um, and that was a um, very moving event for everybody. Another uh, important panel was anti-imperialism and construction of the new world. I'll just give little uh, bits of uh, memory and, and things that were said by the many speakers. They uh, emphasized in this one how Chavez uh, it was basically the revolution, political revolution that Chavez led was basically an extension of Bolivar's battle for independence. And now this was in this stage, the second battle for independence um, against imperialism. Delcy Rodriguez, the vice president talked about how uh, Chavez first laid out his vision of a multipolar, pluripolar world in 1998, when he first came into office. Uh, a world with social justice, without capitalism. And it was not so much linked to theories of industrial Western uh, Marxism, but linked to what 
Evo Morales, who was also there, said was the struggle of our, our ancestors. Um, Evo also pointed out, read some documents from the State Department uh, showing how that the Mon Monroe Doctrine is still much very alive, uh, where the statements said that uh, we can't allow socialism to spread because it threatens our access to resources in the region. Um, like COVID, climate change and capitalism, capitalism has its global impact and it has to be addressed in a global way. And Chavez understood this. He reached out to beyond Latin America, to Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, uh, making links with many countries. Um, Pedro um, of the MST in Brazil also stated that Venezuela is in the vanguard of, of the movement for popular democracy. Um, the Chavez's Bolivarian Revolution changed the political landscape, not only in Latin America, but all over the world, and raised the collective consciousness of, of anti-imperialism. The Bolivarian dream of regional integration uh, was begun when Chavez made alliances, uh, regional alliances, creating CELAC, uh, UNISUR, ALBA, TELESUR, PETO CARIBE, and more. Another important panel was decolonization and socialism of the 21st century, where it was talked about how we have to decolonize our thinking and not be just passive consumers in a market. The need for permanent education and permanent mobilization. The, the key to Venezuelan socialism, it was pointed out, was what Chavez promoted was popular power, regional integration, defending sovereignty, anti-imperialism, and leading to a, a communal society. And in the panel called Participatory, Protagonist, and Popular Democracy, this was elaborated more. Uh, it was pointed out that political power is not just in a vote in a machine once every few years, but also having the power over the economic production in your community. And this was seen in the, leg the important legacy of Chavez in the, in the movement for uh, developing communes, a, a strong example of self-determination. One of the leaders of the El Panal uh, commune in Caracas talked about the constant um, efforts to reflect, to study and discuss collectively in the people's assemblies and that's, that was the solution to overcome problems. Um, popular power, it was noted, was, is a very threat to the elites, especially in the US, where the participation in elections and government structures themselves are set up to not reflect the will of the people. In the important panel about, it was called Media Dictatorship in a Digital Age, basically talked about the democratization of the media and the important battle of ideas even uh, Simone Bolivar, it was pointed out, said, imperialism doesn't just depend on force, but on people's ignorance. Chavez itself was a great communicator, it was pointed out. He listened to and trusted the people. He had a, a weekly um, uh, session where he would answer questions uh, and talk to people in different communities for hours on a Sunday. He was also one of the first presidents to use Twitter. And, and get a mess, his message out that way. Um, the, one of the leaders in Brazil mentioned that we can't um, raise people's consciousness with just rhetoric and theory, but uh, use, the use of art and culture is a way to reach young people, especially the young people that are being targeted very heavily by the right wing. Um, Tanya Diaz, who's the director of the recently formed University of International Communications in Caracas, is um, talked about the, the importance of collective media strategies for there to be cooperation coordination to counter this propaganda that maintains um, basically the imperialist project. Uh, there was a, a special session on the civic military union, which is a key to the resistance of Venezuela, uh, where the military is pledged uh, to a position of anti-imperialism and many are from the working class. And the, the final session was the group of uh, ex-presidents and current presidents from uh, Nicaragua, uh, Raul Castro from Cuba, the president of Arce from Bolivia, <clears throat> and uh, Evo Morales um, from Bolivia, Rafael Correa from Ecuador, Zelaya from a uh, former president from 
uh, Honduras. And one of the things that was clearly stated, Eva Morales said, for people to pay homage to Chavez, they should they they need to, to be more deeply anti-imperialist. And that, that was the answer he gave. Um, there was an ex exhibition of uh, the effects of uh, unilateral coercive measures. There's a vice ministry of the anti-blockade uh, law, and they presented these uh, large uh, panels with detailed history of the quote sanctions and its impact on the people. And uh, this was received and sort of inaugurated by Delcy Rodriguez, the vice president. And throughout, after this conference, in a number of cities, um, there were these, um, it was the, the day of anti-imperialism. There were these tribunals where different panels and speakers would talk about um, the efforts um, to counter the empire, basically. And the, I attended the one in Caracas where the theme, the title was, Venezuela is not a threat, it is hope. Um, uh, Dioses Cabello of the National Assembly talked in detail about the history of the sabotage of the infrastructure, uh, multiple attacks over the years, including burning the, um, trying to thwart the efforts of the election by burning the um, voting machines. Um, they uh, talked about the goal of, is not just to destroy the economy of Venezuela, but to destroy the Bolivarian revolution itself. They talked about uh, the absurd Obama decree in 2015, uh, stating uh, Venezuela is a threat to the national security of the United States, which has led to all these hundreds of coercive measures since then. It's, it's opened the door for them to, to increase and do even more damage to the people of Venezuela, violating all international treaties. But um, uh, Dios Cabello also said, the United States is underestimating the, the resolve and the strength of the uh, Venezuelan people. Jorge um, Rodriguez, the head of the National Assembly, went, went in detail explaining the theft of billions of dollars of uh, Venezuelan's assets, the, the cruel nature of blocking medicines uh, during um, COVID, and, and the complicity of many of the internal opposition in holding up many of these funds um, and getting the money back that's been stolen. They, and he made a very strong statement in this tribunal that from now on, there will be no um, agreements for dialogue with the opposition until the unilateral course of measures end. Um, Rafael Correa uh, emphasized a point in the same tribunal that many people ask what, what socialist country has developed uh, in a way that meets the needs of its people. Well, Cuba is one, but he said, question should be what capitalist country has developed to meet the needs of its people. And he remarked that there is none. Chavez, it was, it was clear from this conference and, and people's input that Chavez has really tapped into a desire for justice and liberation for the people, revived a certain level of hope, pride, and a sense of dignity in the people. Chavez was constantly reinventing and reevaluating um, his ideas and plan. He laid the groundwork for this path to socialism, not a specific detailed model or manual, but um, it, it, and Chavez was, it was remarked many times, it was not just an idea of the past, but he lives on in the, the spirit of Bol Bolivar lives on in the present in the people. And, and constantly was we reminded that the real force of, of Chavismo is more alive now than ever. Um, it, an Iran, Iranian diplomat commented that Chavez is more than a person, he's a plan to save humanity. So I spoke with many people at the conference, friends, people, uh, people I met in the street and the, the economic situation is difficult, although the inflation has improved, there's more food, um, but there are frustrations with the low salaries for public employees, the continued inflation, uh, uh, impatience with dealing with chronic corruptions that's existed long before Chavez. Um, and many people were concerned about these, these um, many evangelical um, movements that are uh, entering many of the, the poor neighborhoods and millions of dollars coming in NGOs from the United States trying to th uh, thwart the future elections, they think. 
So, but I, but all through these difficulties and frustrations, I saw in the people a really deep resilience and creativity and courage, a sense of national identity and pride that's, uh, I saw and many said that is irreversible, that this, the, the spirit of Chavez lives in the people and it's not something that uh, died when Chavez left. Jorge Arriaza always points out that Venezuela is the epicenter of an historical, historical struggle of resistance against the capitalist system, which is in danger uh, all life on the planet. Venezuela needs our solidarity. It's vital to defend its example of profound popular democracy, its sovereignty, its right to choose its own government, and also its right to choose its diplomats, like Alex Saab. I think, I think often this blatant injustice and dishonesty of US policies, where they steal billions of dollars from Venezuela and then complain about why they can't manage their money or block food and medicine for millions of people and then say that, complain that Venezuela is not caring for its people. To counteract these lies and propaganda and the cruel and illegal policies of these coercive measures, it's critical to find opportunities to tell the truth. We need to make more visible the impacts of these coercive policies on, on the Venezuelan people. And I commend this, uh, this space of this webinar uh, for providing that opportunity. Um, long live Chavez, free Alex Saab. Viva Chavez, free Alex Saab. Thank you very much, David Paul, uh, for that um, summary of your experiences in Venezuela, especially at the international gathering. Um, we can feel your, you know, your commitment and your enthusiasm that the Venezuelan spirit that is still in you from your time there and um, really appreciate your sharing um, just a few reflections of what must have been uh, just a really uh, incredible delegation with the Alliance for Global Justice and with all of the gathered international guests to mark 10 years since the passing of Comandante Chavez. Um, I, when you were speaking, it reminded me of, of something I wanted to share at today's picket and in, in future pickets as well. Um, the Venezuela analysis has put together a, an infographic, um, which is a, a summary of the blockade. I'll just zoom in maybe on this top part. Um, because I think it's done a, a really good job of summarizing um, what you were explaining as far as the overall impacts that that Venezuela, you know, is making international agreements with other sanctioned countries. Diplomats such as Alex Saab are under attack uh, so strongly because uh, the U.S. doesn't want Venezuela to be able to trade uh, normally with anyone. And that's why this is a blockade. And it involves medical imports, oil, fuel, seized assets, frozen assets, um, exactly these things. So we'll put a, a link to the chat in the chat to this infographic from um, Venezuela analysis. Um, that's a really useful thing to share and to help um, explain to others why this isn't just the U.S. Uh, you know, imposing some sanctions or some Venezuelan officials uh, not being able to have bank accounts in the United States. It is overarching. It is a form of, of war against a people, and it is uh, trying to bring about the overthrow of the Bolivarian revolutionary process. But as you've reminded us, uh, the people of Venezuela are very firm in their commitment and are fighting every day. And so I really appreciate you bringing that reflection here today. Thank you. So um, for our final speaker at the panel today, um, we have a speaker from Canada. We haven't talked very much today about Canada's complicity in blockade, sanctions, and other attacks against Venezuela. Um, but Canada is right there with the United States. Um, although a smaller country, they still have a very hostile relationship with the democratically elected, elected government of Venezuela. And it's very important here that we, as people in Canada, um, highlight the government's role in imposing a humanitarian difficulties on the people of Venezuela. So 
to do partly that and also to give us a bit of an idea of the kind of larger picture when it comes to Canada's role in Latin America. Um, we have Bhagwant Sandhu, who is a retired director general with the federal government in Canada. He's also held executive positions in the British Columbia and Ontario provincial governments. And from that experience is now a writer and an analyst with a keen interest in Canada's contemporary foreign policy and with a very much insider view of the functioning of the government of Canada. So um, Bhagwant, the floor is yours, welcome. Thank you very much, Alison. Uh, it's a pleasure once again. I think probably for the 25th time to uh, be on the monthly picket, because <laughs> I think I've been on all of them. Uh, and also thank you for those kind uh, words of uh, introduction. Um, I wanted to just uh, take a perspective that, you know, for a lot of us who believe in equality and justice and, and, and right of people to determination, self-determination, to pick the kinds of governments that they want, uh, and to be ruled by uh, as they as they think is appropriate, uh, it, it's easy to get uh, uh, you know often uh, depressed because we don't see the results like say the other side would see. I mean, for them, let's bring out the guns and the sanctions and the monies and voila, you know. Uh, but we have to slog away at it. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm I. I'm recognizing that we've got close to a hundred people from all over the world on this webinar. I want to just take a folk, uh, uh, just pull back the lens a little bit and uh, talk a little bit about sort of the broader context on, as you said, on you know what's going on and, and why are things happening? And because there's a bigger picture to it all, as we all know, and as David pointed out. Um, and within that, also to let you all know that, you know, uh, we in Canada are also keeping uh, the fire lit on our uh, on our government. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, my I'm not a writer or a columnist, but it's thanks to Allison. And it was one of the pickets that we did for Venezuela uh, last oh, a couple of years ago. I was a Venezuelan uh, Black History Month that I was involved in, and uh, that started a uh, process and writing and before you know it you know uh, kind of a, a, a just a, a interest happens and I have to let you know that these things you know every step that we do uh, these things are read by uh, policymakers uh, I would not be surprised that uh, you know the seminar uh, is being uh, uh, watched or listened to because you know voices we are stakeholders we tend to forget we always see ourselves as sort of you know the opposition or we're fighting against a system or something but we are actually stakeholders in the directions that our country takes in the policies that our prime ministers make so i think it's important for us to continue in that spirit continue with the activism because while it won't happen in this year's budget as it was today at release but it does happen uh, over time so persistence patience and just keeping each other uh, spiritually uh, uh, excited and, and happy I think is, is the way to go so on that point uh, I'll just start my remarks by saying that some of you may or may not know but uh, the U.S. Uh, President Joe Biden was in Canada last week and, uh, you know, as with all sort of presidential visits, um, there's always a lot of hoopla, a lot of planning happens and a lot of kind of, you know, uh, well, it's, it's a state visit it's, it's, it's Caesar from Rome has come to the colonies, literally, and that's what this was about. Um, and as we watched what the discussions were, uh, usually there's a lead up to the big two to three days uh, events. And one of the lead ups was, believe it or not, um, the Minister of International uh, uh, Development, Harjit Sajjan, had held the week before, uh, co-chaired uh, 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 a meeting, a virtual meeting on uh, uh, migrants. And it's really interesting that in, in Canada, our, the whole debate currently started on, there's a, 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 a crossing across the border in, in Quebec. And uh, you know, there's a lot of migrants that were coming in from you know, Haiti, uh, Cameroon, uh, Afghanistan, you know, all the countries that we've gone in and destroyed basically, uh, and now they're coming across. And there's a whole complexity in terms of policy that, that, that it's easier for them to cross the unchecked border than to go to the formal channels. Uh, but here was uh, our, min our minister co-chairing uh, a panel discussion on, on uh, migrants focused on, guess what, Venezuela, right? 
So for sure, we thought, okay, this is this is just a lead up. Something's going to happen to it. Uh, but funny enough, it didn't. Um, and I think that had to do a lot the effect that there are little voices in the little corners uh, that are able to, you know, whether it's a postcard campaign that you're planning or even letter writing or these kinds of meetings that we have, that they have an impact. Having said that, and that's just a note to tell everybody that's listening in, that number one, that, uh, you know, we're not sitting idle in Canada. And number two, that, uh, you know, we're your brothers and sisters, right? And uh, we're united in the struggle. So it's going to take a lot of effort, but let's not get, uh, let's remain positive and, and active. We, we will see results. Um, with that kind of context, uh, my own personal interest, and this is a piece that I've been researching and working on, it's by no means original. I mean, nothing is. Um, I've heard other more, much more uh, uh, writers and, 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 and researchers who have studied this subject matter and so forth. And I want you to understand, you know, what is Canada's obsession with Haiti, Venezuela, Bolivia, like what the heck, what gives, right? It's not like uh, we have a large diaspora here that's, you know, egging them on for, for action or to do those sort of stuff that we do. Um, so I, when, as I started uh, talking to different people and, and just doing the study and stuff, and, it, it, and I've named this that, uh, and it's too bad that this was not on the agenda with uh, between uh, uh, our Prime Minister Trudeau and uh, Joe Biden. Of course, it would not be. And the agenda item that I wish they had it on is what I would call the constitutional coup d'etat. Okay, so it's a dirty trick. It's a brand new dirty trick, believe it or not, uh, that American presidents, including Joe Biden, have used to overthrow duly elected governments in the global south. Obviously, the Americans are, are, are leading the charge, but Canada is not far behind. So despite our public image that, you know, we're sort of a multicultural, you know, small country and so forth, um, we've got a lot of, uh, you know, uh, stuff in our closet as well. So while they're leading the charge, I would say we're actually, like the gangsters do, we're riding shotgun for the Americans. And this is how it works. A democratic elected leader starts their mandate in earnest, right? which ends up angering the oligarchs and Western corporate interests, usually in mining and oil. Uh, Americans enter the scene, they recruit someone from the opposition, the media kicks in with a hatchet job, the, the judiciary charges the leader with some vague procedural uh, inconsistency, and then that leads up to a constitutional crisis. And before you know it, the unsuspecting leader gets escorted out of office, Canada completes the process by rushing in to recognize a new replacement. That's how it works. Now, some people call this as the regime change methodology as legal fare, as in legal warfare, because it uses the legal system and its institutions to delegitimize the uh, offending opponent. Um, so if you want to ever replace an elected head of state, duly democratically elected state with an unelected puppet, then really this is the way to go. Uh, it makes uh, the suspected and alleged Chinese interference in Canadian elections really look like ineffective chump change. So let me go through uh, 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 some of the examples. As we know, it was legal fair was first tested, I would say, in Venezuela. So while Nicolas Maduro had won the presidential elections fair square, but it upset, you know, Western corporate interests, oligarch, oligarchs, as I said. In this case, I would think it's mostly the oil companies. The Americans recruited uh, Juan Guaido from the National Assembly, and like clockwork, the constitutional crisis erupts. And before the Supreme Court, let's not forget, the Supreme Court had not even issued a ruling because it was investigating the, 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 the charges and whatnot. The Americans had gone and recognized the unelected Guaido as uh, Venezuela's new president. Canada immediately followed suit, and Prime Minister Trudeau, in fact, ended up holding Juan Guaido for an official Ottawa visit in uh, January 2020. It was the same thing that happened in Bolivia. We had Evo Morales, indigenous leader, wins the president's election in 2019. His politics are not palatable to mining industry bigwigs. The Americans recruit uh, you know, opposition Senator Enyes. She initiates legal action and invalidates Morales' victory. And just like that, she becomes president. Canada, once again, zooms in to support her and her co-conspirators. Uh, co and at that time, our foreign affairs minister, Krista Freeland, she tweeted, you know, Bolivians deserve the voice, Boliv 
Bolivians deserve to have their voices heard, right? They had just elected somebody, right? And then she's supporting uh, uh, somebody who has just done a coup d'etat, uh, conspirator. So anyway, you get the picture. Uh, and it was also played against the Brazilian president, uh, if you remember, uh, you know, uh, President Lula and his successor Dilma Rousseff uh, to pave the way for the for the far right populist uh, Bolsonaro. It is also, uh, frankly, was played against uh, Imran Khan of Pakistan. Likewise, he suffered the same fate in 2022, just last year. He was bamboozled by the dirty tricksters for being too close to China, but not close enough to the U.S. backed Pakistani army. Uh, Count Khan actually went on live TV, claimed to have proof that U.S. Uh, Assistant Secretary of uh, State Donald Liu had threatened his removal from office. I mean, you can actually see it live. He's, he's claiming that. And more recently, we've seen Peru. Uh, Pedro Castillo, indigenous high school teacher, assumes office after winning the election. And it's almost immediately, almost immediately to the dime, the, the coup d'etat gets triggered. U.S. Ambassador Lisa Kenna the former CIA operative. She meets with the members of the opposition uh, Peruvian Congress. The media starts painting Castillo as incompetent. I mean, this is the, 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 the shock of it that, you know, the, the majority of uh, people elect, but the media, of course, the deep pocket comes in and starts saying, well, he's incompetent. He doesn't know what he's doing. Once again, constitutional court declares his presidency illegitimate and voila, Castillo is out of, uh, ousted from office. And there again, Canada is right there. We're the first country uh, with Foreign uh, Affairs Minister uh, Melanie Jolie. She tweeted our support for the uh, transition government. She actually called it the transition government, where it's just months that somebody had actually won the election. And then our ambassador to Peru, Luis Marcot, uh, went an extra step. And last year in December, it was just two weeks after Castillo had been arrested that he tweeted, I met today with President Boluarte. Okay, he's calling <laughs> a president. The reasoning was to, for to meet with the unelected Dina Boluarte was to reiterate, this is in quotes, to reiterate Canada's commitment to continue strengthening the relationship and to support human rights and transparency in, and fair elections. Uh, just the irony of it, let alone the stupidity of it, right? Uh, I mean, there's an assumption that everybody else is just stupid and we can just go in and kind of just, you know, rewrite history. Um, fairness, as we know, in the Peruvian elections was never a question. It was always about Pedro Castillo. Uh, Peru, as anybody in Canada, any activist knows, is a mecca for mining. And Canadian mining companies have a very, very lousy record there. Uh, it turns out that Castillo is a union leader from Peru's uh, Cajamarca region which is home to South America's largest gold mine. It is also Peru's poorest region. So largest gold mine, poorest region. The dots are not hard to connect. He had to go. That all said, and all that background, I would say to my colleagues that are listening in, as I started earlier, that you know, despite all the dirty tricksters and all the, the, the CIA and the Canadian plots and whatever have you, the problem with the executioners uh, of, of such these uh, uh, you know, coup d'etats and legal fare is that they always underestimate the power of ordinary people. That's something we have to remind ourselves, right? That no matter who are the, the Goliath always underestimates the power of ordinary people. So we know that street demonstrations broke out when Morales was overthrown. 700 people got killed or injured. When the new elections were held in 2020, Morales' party was voted back in Movimiento al Socialismo, I think it's called, Moved, went one back with a majority. And yes, meanwhile, well, she's doing, last I was reading, uh, 10 years for uh, treason in a Bolivian jail. Uh, Lula too won the presidential election, as you know, he's definitely back on the international stage. And uh, as of last week, uh, Omran Khan is making a huge comeback. Violent protests have rocked Pakistan. And according to his lawyers, the election commission has canceled all the arrest warrants against him. As for Venezuela, well, remember one, one Guido? Uh, I don't think he could put together two people to listen to what he has to say anymore. His career politically is pretty much, if not totally uh, tanked. Um, Americans are, you know, despite uh, uh, the work that still needs to be done, they're making uh, uh, efforts, uh, emissaries and whatnot to 
do some degree of rapprochement with Venezuela. Chevron Corporation is drilling. Um, and in Peru, 500 uh, pro-democracy protesters either killed or, or hospitalized. It's unlikely that the Boluarte will last very long. So the question that it becomes is for people like us, uh, Canadians, and I think this is the same story no matter where you are in the US, UK, in anywhere in Europe, uh, it's the same kind of methodology at play. And when you ask them, well, you know, we wonder as Canadians, well, what that, what does happen? Because America can can switch on a dime and it can move and do whatever whatever suits suits it, uh, geopolitical interests and its hegemony. Uh, but the little players that got recruited, like countries like Canada, what happens to them? Well, fact is that the you know a coup d'état, engineering a coup d'état to oust an elected head of state of a sovereign country is against international law. And it's not much different, frankly, that I think we have to remind everybody in principle than Russia invading Ukraine. Um, Canada could have let democracy run its course. In fact, we do it all over Europe, in Holland, Hungary, Italy, France, Spain, Sweden. We waited out far right demagogues. We're waiting out the far right demagogue in Italy right now, okay? As they win and lose elections. But when it comes to the global South, when it comes to Venezuela, when it comes to South America, what we do is not only illegal, it's quite frankly, immoral. So I say that, you know, wherever you in whatever small town in Canada or the big city and uh, Prime Minister Trudeau comes up and he uh, starts talking about the rules-based international order. And then he wonders why people in the global South are rolling their eyes as they have done as they try to recruit them towards the cause of uh, Ukraine in, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America. Nobody signed on to that, right? Uh, then I think that maybe we should just remind him that he ought to look in the mirror, which is, uh, you know, to the, the gangsters when they drive, you got the guy with the, <laughs> the driver, which is America, and he's got us seated on the passenger side. And the mirror is right above on the passenger side where he's riding shotgun with uh, his proverbial partner in crime, Joe Biden. And that's all I had to say. Thank you, Bhagwan, for that image at the end. I think uh, if anyone on here is a political cartoonist, some cartoons to go with your articles would be excellent. Um, the, uh, I, I think that's the, that's the important point, right, is that the US government and Canada are hand in hand working together, um, complicit in these attacks on not only Venezuela, but the people of Latin America and poor and oppressed countries around the world. Um, going back to when you were talking about um, immigrants, migrants, refugees, uh, how can we have so many conversations between these two countries that never mention the reason that people are forced to leave their homes is because of wars, sanctions, occupations, environmental degradation imposed on them by the governments of Canada and the United States and uh, the corporations that uh, are receive favor from these governments. So I think um, that's a very important point to be making in our picket here today and to uh, keep fueling our, our work because you also brought the important point of, of uh, maintaining our, our outlook that the only way we can win is if we can struggle. And if we struggle, we have a chance to win, a fighting chance. And so here we are. Thank you, Bhagwan Sandhu. And I encourage people um, to post or to follow uh, his articles and writings. We'll put a recent one in the chat um, and you can always uh, catch those um, online. So uh, that wraps up kind of the main panel of our uh, webinar, the 25th consecutive monthly webinar action today. Uh, but we do have joining uh, with us from Venezuela, Professor Luis Acuna. Professor Luis Acuna is the charge de affairs of the Venezuelan embassy here in Canada, but has been in Venezuela continuing the work as the charge de affairs um, because of the government of Canada's um, unwillingness to cooperate with the democratically elected government of Venezuela because of this breakdown in relations uh, brought on by the government of Canada's hostility. And therefore, uh, Professor Luis Acuna does his work from, from Venezuela for now. 
We're really honored to have him with us every month at the monthly picket actions and to bring his experience and his political analysis of what's happening um, with uh, Canada or US Venezuela relations at the moment. Um, Professor Luis Acuno is also the former governor of the state of Sucre in Venezuela and has been a, a longtime fighter in the Bolivarian revolutionary process. So uh, thank you, Professor Luis Acuna, for joining us. It's really great to, to have you with us here today. Just please go ahead and share anything you'd like. Hello, Alison. Uh, thanks very much for again this 26 in a row uh, webinar, this picket line uh, in, you know, in behalf of the Venezuelan people. Mainly in this work that you and all your team in for this time and all the other uh, contributors from Canada and the US in behalf of uh, the freedom of uh, Alitsab. As you know, uh, this uh, work have been going have been been going on for quite a while. Uh, we have had many many uh, much information in this webinar, as the one that uh, Roy gave us today, the ones that uh, every week, almost every month. Uh, Indriana Barada gave off uh, about what is going on with the trial of uh, Alex Saab. But as you know, the, the seize of uh, Alex is not a diplomatic system, it's, uh, it's a political one. We know that uh, the US will not hear any judge. They will only hear the political judge that they have to keep uh, Alex Saab uh, in jail as a punishment to Venezuela because we broke the sanctions. Uh, Alex Saab was able to break the sanction and bring food to the people of Venezuela and bring uh, medicines to the people of Venezuela. That's the sin of uh, Alex Saab, it's not other. And, and they, will, they won't forgive Alex Saab, even when Alex Saab at this moment needs uh, the, you know, the help. I mean, he's in a, in a situation, in a medical situation that he needs uh, uh, the humanitarian aid from the government of the US. Uh, we wish that he could get all the medical assistance he needs we know that they won't free him so easily. Uh, we are working on that. We are working ha very hard on the, uh, you know, legal situation of Alex Saab. We have demonstrated that he doesn't have any, any, anything. He he doesn't owe anything to the to the uh, law in the in the U.S. And he is a diplomat. We know that. So we hope that uh, the case of Alex Saab solves as soon as, as it, it is possible. And he needs it to be solved. From here, uh, we want to thank you and everyone who is uh, working in behalf of the freedom of, uh, of Alex Saab. It's very important for the pre President Biden to receive this postcard from citizens of the US and citizens of Canada, more than from citizens of Venezuela. Uh, so I wish that uh, citizens of Canada and the US are able to send a postcard to President Biden. They are the taxpayers of, uh, of the government of the US. So President Biden should hear them. And I want to thank David Paul for the very, the extraordinary uh, talk of, of, of tonight, because he really developed what uh, President 
Hugo Chavez meant for, for Latin America and for Venezuela. And the legacy of uh, President Chavez will stay. We know that it will stay. And it's very, very important all the uh, statements that, uh, that David Paul made tonight in, in you know, telling what Hugo Chavez was able to do in a very, very short time for Venezuela, for Latin America, and for our self-determination. And regarding to Bag Bagwan Sandu, I feel very, very happy that someone like him is able to talk about the true uh, foreign policy of Canada regarding mainly uh, Latin America. Uh, because most Canadians don't, they, they don't know what's going on. Uh, they don't even know what is going on with the foreign policy around the world. And much less they know what is going on in Latin America. And it's very important that I assess that regarding Venezuela, that policy of uh, changing government in, 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 in this country uh, was done mainly by Canada. Canada, Canada. Canada was the country that led it the, the construction of the, uh, the Lima Group that was the one who led the, the change of government in Canada with Juan Guaido. And uh, the strength of the people of Venezuela was able to support the very, very strong uh, work that Canada made with the, the Lima Group uh, against us. And Juan Guaido is nothing at this moment. Not even in Venezuela, he, he never meant anything. But uh, abroad of Venezuela, he, he doesn't mean anything at this moment. So uh, we hope we will keep going. And we are uh, working very hard for the elections in, 19, in 2024. Now the government of Canada and the government of the US are working in a change of government, but putting much, much, more, much money on the opposition so they can, you know, do as much as they can for the elections in 2024. But we hope that we will we'll be able to again defeat the, the, the opposition uh, now. So Alison, thanks very much for the webinar today. Uh, we know that this webinar is meant for the self-determination of Venezuela, for the hands of Venezuela of all countries. Uh, Venezuela only should hear to the Venezuelan people regarding his internal affairs. So thanks very much, uh, Alison, and hello to all Canadians and US uh, citizens who are here in this uh, uh, webinar tonight. Thank you uh, very much, Professor Luis Acuna. Um, really, I know it's uh, monthly, uh, just such a, a pleasure and we're grateful to have your time and your perspective, as I've said. Um, you've inspired many people in the chat to write um, about um, continuing this work for Venezuela, continuing to unite our voices every month, um, and then also uh, inspiring people to join the postcard campaign, which I very much appreciate. Um, so Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice has launched uh, Venezuela Solidarity Campaign, has launched this pick, uh, postcard. Uh, it has Bria Alex Saab on the front. Oh, there we go. And a message of solidarity and support on the back um, with some facts. A uh, place to put your name, of course, you can put your country. It will also be in the postmark and for you to sign um, where uh, you are sending this postcard. It's going to US President Joe Biden. And uh, as someone wrote in the chat, uh, let's flood the White House. So that means sending multiple copies of this postcard. That means uh, sending us an email at fttvenezuelasolidarity at gmail.com, which is just what put in the chat to get copies of the postcard, um, or I can send you the PDF or JPEGs for you to print some of your own. Uh, you can put 
them in the mail uh, every day uh, or multiple times a day and set, and give to your friends and family. I also encourage people when you send the postcard to uh, take a picture, take a selfie, post it online, say I'm sending this postcard at, as Roger Waters instructed us, at POTUS, which is Joe Biden on Twitter, um, and make it known that this is a united worldwide movement calling for freedom for Alex Saab. Alex Saab's imprisonment is a violation of the international laws that govern diplomats known as the Vienna Convention. It is a violation of his human rights, and it is a political case, as we've been reminded by Professor Luis Acuna. Alex Saab is in prison because he stood for Venezuela's sovereignty and self-determination and dared to represent the government of Venezuela in contract negotiations uh, with Iran, another sanctioned country. And according to the United States, sanctioned blockaded countries are not allowed to trade with another, uh, with one another. People are not allowed to take the matter into their own hands and say, we choose our own government, we choose who we trade with, and we'll make the contracts that we need to provide food, fuel, and medicines to our people. This is what the U.S. government is punishing Alex Saab and the people of Venezuela for. So um, that is where um, we started today, hearing from Roigar Lopez of the Free Alex Saab movement, uh, hearing from David Paul from the United States, uh, joining us from the Sanctions Kill Coalition and the Embassy, em, Venezuelan Embassy Protection Collective, and then Bhagwant Sandhu, an uh, analyst and writer here in Canada. Um, so we just have a few greetings from people uh, joining from uh, different parts of Canada who wanted to say a quick hello and, and commitment to their continued solidarity with Venezuela against this criminal blockade and sanctions and continue demand freedom for Alex Saab. Um, so I'm going to invite those folks to join us, and then uh, we'll do a brief summary and then a group photo. So again, the information for the Free Alex Saab postcard campaign is in the chat. Send those emails, uh, you know, give me a, a call or a WhatsApp too, and uh, we'll get this to you as soon as possible so we can really launch this campaign and flood the White House and Joe Biden with these postcards. So. Um, First up, let me just see who's on our list here. Um, Dean Niebert usually posts a message in the chat from the Hamilton Coalition to stop the war. Uh, but did you want to unmute your microphone and say anything today? It's great to have you here. Uh, yes, thanks for the invite. Uh, it's much appreciated. Uh, I guess I'm here uh, ostensibly on behalf of uh, the executive of the Wentworth Hamilton Coalition to stop the war. And I mean, this isn't a technically a war, but it is a war. You know, it's a war for uh, uh, understanding and, and justice. So it's a nonviolent war that we're waging, but it's a war nonetheless. And uh, uh, it's unconscionable, the position that the U.S. has taken on this. You know, this gentleman, at great risk to his physical well-being, was on a, 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 a mission of mercy, you know, to uh, get medicines, you know, vaccines, you know, COVID vaccines for, you know, for the population. What what a a, a, a grievous wrong on his part, but it's uh, it's it's uh, you know it's just a shame. I also like that you you put the little blurb in from Roger Waters, who's been advocating for uh, Assange as well. This isn't any different. This is just you know a, another iteration of the same uh, draconian. Uh, a weight throwing around that the U.S. Uh, accomplishes in the world. So uh, I want to uh, congratulate the presenters tonight. Incredibly well done, well thought out, well reasoned, totally truthful, and uh, we we need we can win this fight. We can win this for, war. Uh, thanks to Allison and and uh, the rest of you that participated tonight. Great, and thank you to the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War and, and to Dean Ebert and all of your co-fighters for your constant and consistent work for just causes against wars, occupations, and sanctions. We are often in the streets together um, on different parts of Canada, and it's great to have you here today. Uh, so the next I have is Karen Rodman. 
not to put you on the spot, Karen, but if you'd like to say a few words from Just Peace Advocates, it's really, it's great to have you here as night, tonight as well. Great. It's very much my honor and thank you for keeping the uh, steadfast beat, uh, heartbeat going every month. Uh, that uh, that smud, as you would say in Arabic, is so important. So we appreciate that and uh, it brings us together to remember that we can have the strength for the fight. Um, certainly uh, looking at Canada's role with the Lima Group and looking at the, the materials from the uh, Global Affairs Canada and the Lima Group and comparing them through the entire uh, process of creating this uh, narrative around Venezuela made it hard to tell the difference between Global Affairs Canada and what was the Lima Group. In fact, they were pretty much one in the same, as the professor has said, when you look at the documents. Um, and in terms of sanctions, um, our friends at Hamilton's uh, Coalition to Stop the War and Sanctions Kill with Just Peace Advocates and other groups will be uh, doing um, some in-person uh, sessions around a uh, sanctions and featuring uh, the uh, global uh, sanctions, the global wrecking ball uh, book uh, in uh, Hamilton, Toronto, Ottawa, and uh, Montreal, as well as virtual. So that watch for that later in April. And if I could, in solidarity, I will also put in the link uh, for the parliamentary petition that wraps up very shortly in terms of lifting sanctions on, uh, on Syria as well. So um, thank you so much. It's uh, an honor to be part of uh, of this movement and uh, and to uh, connect with you monthly. Thank you, Karen. Yes, please feel free in the chat to post about upcoming events and um, also about um, the this wrecking ball uh, book uh, that I know is is out. And it's great to hear that you'll be hosting some uh, in person events in Ontario. We hope to have uh, some out here on this coast as well. Um, so uh, to close off our greetings, I have Janine Solenke. Janine is here from the Executive of Mobilization Against War and Occupation, uh, Vancouver's Anti-War Coalition. Janine, go ahead. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to see so many people um, on the uh, webinar today on our virtual action and also in the chat. Um, on behalf of Mobilization Against War and Occupation, uh, I want to thank the organizers for bringing us together um, in defense of our Venezuelan sisters and brothers, and also to all of the speakers who are on today. We, I think, know very well that the U.S. Uh, is extremely hypocritical um, with their claims of being a worldwide authority on human rights and with their audacity when they claim other nations are terrorist states or rogue states or axis of evil. Um, this is all well we know that the United States is the biggest terrorist around the world and the worst abuser of human rights, uh, both for people around the world and even their own people in the US. Um, just last weekend, we marked eight years of the Saudi-led US and Canada-backed and armed war on Yemen, um, which has resulted in what the United Nations uh, calls, calls the world's worst humanitarian crisis. Um, and Canada, of course, being a very big part of that, um, uh, arming Saudi Arabia with about $1 billion worth of weapons a year. And due to that, and due to also the, the air, sea, and land blockade that Saudi Arabia has imposed on Yemen, which the US and Canada have supported, 80% of Yemen is um, struggling to access food, safe drinking water, and adequate health services. We're also marking uh, 20 years this month since the brutal so-called shock and awe, um, um, brutal bombing campaign that started the US-led invasion and then war and occupation for 20 years. Um, and still still going with US troops in, uh, in Iraq still. And we've seen what this did to Iraq. We know what US military invasions and occupations and, uh, and wars, what they cause for people all around the world. We know when they are talking about uh, Venezuela and claiming they have some sort of authority uh, we know it's because Venezuela is doing something right. They're doing something for their people and that the United States um, is never ever um, 
has, has the interests of poor and working people in mind. I think it's as some of the previous speakers as uh, the Hamilton Coalition Against the War just previously said, um, another way that uh, is a form of war is through sanctions. And they have tried, the United States and their allies such as Canada have tried to strangle Venezuela along with Cuba, along with Iran, along with so many other countries all around the world who aren't following the dictates of the US government. Um, and it's so important that we're here together saying whether it's war, whether it's occupation, whether it's sanctions, whether it's threats, we need to demand self-determination for all oppressed nations and that includes Venezuela. Um, so in mobilization against war and occupation here in Vancouver, Canada, uh, we demand self-determination for all oppressed nations um, from Yemen to Palestine, indigenous nations, Cuba, and for Venezuela. Um, so as we're all here today, lift the blockade, lift the sanctions, hands off Venezuela. Thank you. Hands off Venezuela. Free Alex Saab. Thank you very much to Janine Solanke, to all of the panelists and participants. The chat has been, I think, extra uh, lively and fruitful tonight with continued commitment to work for freedom for jailed Venezuelan diplomat Alex Saab, and also uh, some upcoming events and links and information. So please uh, peruse the chat in these next few minutes. Make sure you have the information that you need. Um, we will definitely be sending out an email following the picket regarding uh, the postcard campaign and how you can get involved. Uh, we will also uh, be letting you know about the next monthly picket action, uh, which will be taking place on Tuesday, February, or Tuesday, April uh, 25th. Um, where we once again demand, unite our voices and demand hands off Venezuela and free Alex Saab. Um, this will come at uh, a time when we are closer, as, as Roy Gar told us in the beginning, to uh, hearing back from the 11th Circuit uh, Appeals Court in the United States, which is currently hearing uh, regarding the appeal of Alex Saab, um, the US government has uh, refused to recognize the diplomatic status of Alex Saab and the courts have hand in hand followed suit despite having uh, no evidence and despite uh, being in violation of the Vienna Convention and, and multiple other uh, evidences showing to the contrary that Venezuelan diplomat Alex Saab is indeed a, a diplomat. He's just a diplomat of the government uh, that the U.S. refuses to recognize, but is voted by the people of Venezuela. So um, let's go ahead and uh, commit to joining at the next picket on April 25th and also um, to joining in the postcard campaign and sending letters to Alex Saab as well. So um, those are going to be taking uh, you can send letters, we'll put the chat, uh, the link in the chat again, you can send those letters directly to the Free Alex Saab movement email address, and then you can join in that way. Um, I've also noticed in the chat there is going to be a report back from a trip to Venezuela from Massachusetts Peace Action. Um, that is on April 20th at 7 p.m. Uh, they also sent a delegation down to the uh, ten, events marking the 10th anniversary of the um, passing of Comandante Chavez. And so that link is in the chat from Ellen Mass. Thank you for posting that. And um, we're gonna go ahead and get folks upgraded here. So if you would like to join the uh, photo, we take a group photo together and unite our voices in some chanting, uh, then you uh, will receive an invitation uh, to rejoin the picket as a panelist mm -hmm. in your uh, phone or in your in uh, your phone or on your screen and you can indicate, yes, I would like to join the um, rejoin the picket as a panelist. 
Oh, I've just noticed actually that the announcement from Ellen was only sent to hosts and panelists. I am going to resend that to everybody. So I just put that there. That is the Massachusetts Peace Action webinar report back from Venezuela. I see folks are starting to turn on their cameras. Look at those beautiful faces. Um, please uh, accept the invitation. If you've not received an invitation and you would like to join, please raise your hand or post in the chat and we will make sure to send you that invitation. And we will allow everyone to unmute shortly um, and we'll chant together to close off today's monthly picket action. So again, if you haven't received the invitation, please raise your hand if you are able to join and would like to. It's really great to see your faces. Um, post in the chat or raise your hand. If you haven't gotten the invitation, we'll just give it another minute. Again, thank you to our excellent panelists uh, tonight. It's been really great to hear from you. Roigar Lopez, Professor Luis Acuna, Bhagwan Sandu, and David Paul. Um, we will continue to uh, organize these pickets and be together. Oh, I see that Mary Carmen Guevara is also here from Ottawa. It's really great to see you, Mary Carmen. Let's go ahead and allow folks to, to uh, speak and unmute your mics and let's do some chanting together and unite our voices here at the 25th monthly online picket action. We've also all slowly been improving our sign game. Look at those signs, they look beautiful. All right, all together, free Alex Saab. Free, free Alex, Alex Saab. Saab. Free Alex Saab. Free Alex Saab. Free Alex Saab right now. Alex Saab. Now. Alex Saab now. All right, everyone. Very good to see you all. We'll see you next month. Let's continue this work. To continue to support one another. Actions in the streets, sending postcards, joining webinars. Together, we will win. Venceremos. 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 Free Alex 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 Free Alex